Good morning and welcome to online worship at Richmond Hill United Church. If you don't have one yet, grab a coffee or a tea. Be sure to grab your candles, which we're going to light as, as we begin to worship together. But before we begin, I'd like to offer a big thanks to Barb Cooper, Craig Lee, uh, who sing a duet accompanied by Mary Lee and Barry. And thanks as well to all who support RHUC financially through PAR, through Canada Helps or by check, and all who continue to reach out in our community in a spirit of love and of care. Your generosity of spirit is so appreciated. Now as a sign of that love and care, we now kindle light. As we have lit the candle here, I invite you now to light your candle at home. The light that burns here and in all of our homes burns within each of us, holding us in love and inviting us to reach out in love for others. And they say that justice is love in action. And so we acknowledge that we come together in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the credit. And we also stand in solidarity with any who were marginalized and excluded, committing to be a safer space for all people, all races, cultures, orientations, genders, body types, identities, histories, abilities, beliefs, circumstances. Tense, shalom, dabro pajalovitz. Friends, each Sunday we come together to pray, to worship, to meditate on words that have offered light and guidance to those who came before us and continue to be a lamp for us even now. Let us pray. Shine bright within us, holy wisdom. Shine bright and show us the path we need this day. Illuminate your way of love and understanding deep within us. A light to pierce the fog of hatred and division in our world. Speak your truth in our hearts. Keep repeating your teachings that we may continue to seek your path and follow your word. We pray in the name of the one who echoes your voice. Amen. And so we join together in singing Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. It is found, if you have a hymn book at home, on Voices United, number 368. Otherwise, it is projected on your computer screen.
As we prepare to hear today's readings, we pray this prayer for openness. Let us pray. Holy love, speak your word in us once more. Speak your grace and bring forth new life, as once you did at the beginning of time. Renew your image in us and help us see the same in one another. We live in a world more focused on how to get ahead than looking after one another. Open our hearts and minds to the promise of your reign that we may seek reconciliation with those from whom we are estranged and justice for those for whom we have failed to speak. Amen. This morning, we begin a series of parables told by Jesus. This parable is interesting as Jesus offers an explanation. Many scholars assume this explanation was added by Matthew. So this morning, we will consider just Jesus's original words. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Jesus sat down beside the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he climbed into a boat and sat down. The whole crowd was standing on the shore. He spoke to them in parables. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the path and the birds came out and ate it. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where the soil was shallow. They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seed fell on the good soil and bore fruit. In one case, a yield of 100 to 1. In another case, a yield of 60 to 1. And in another case, a yield of 30 to 1. Everyone who has ears should pay attention.
Our next reading is from Race and the Cosmos, An Invitation to View the World Differently by Barbara A. Holmes. Barbara Holmes is a spiritual teacher, activist, author, and scholar focused on African-American spirituality, mysticism, cosmology, and culture. She is on the faculty of the Center for Action and Contemplation in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In the scientific realm, the foundations for hierarchy, dominance, and rationality are crumbling. While proponents of gender, class, racial, and sexual equity have found their public voices. We are not hamsters on a wheel waiting to fall into the cedar shavings at the bottom of the cage. We are seekers of light and life, bearers of shadow and burdens. We are struggling together to journey together towards moral fulfillment. We are learning to embrace the unfathomable darkness where God dwells with enthusiasm that equals our love of light. Physics and cosmology have metaphors and languages to help us awaken to these and other possibilities. We are not just citizens of one nation or another, but of the human and cosmic community. The Bible is tricky, especially parables. They're supposed to make us think, but we often read them through the lenses of what others have said. And this is especially true of today's parable, because not only do we get the words, but we usually read the interpretation that's later in the chapter. The interpretation claims to be from Jesus, but what we're glimpsing really is a sermon of sorts as the author of Matthew takes Jesus's words and then applies them to his situation in his community. So taking that cue, I'd like to consider something critical for us right now. I'd like to ponder the parable in terms of racism, especially through Ijoma Oluwu's words so you want to talk about race, a book which I've been reading as part of a study with some colleagues. And before I begin, I'd like to share an assumption that every person, the proverbial seed, has a right to good soil. That is a right to thrive. That doesn't mean that there won't be life situations that can't be avoided, but I believe there is systemic barriers in Canada in the U.S. and other parts of the world that are preventing Black, Indigenous, and other racialized people from thriving. These are grounded in biases that are the opposite to Barbara Holmes' assertion that we're all citizens of a human and cosmic community. In fact, what she later calls our self-induced dreams of control, domination, victimization, and self-hatred. So, what are these barriers? I'd like to begin by looking at the seeds that fall on the path. The birds in the image remind me of the microaggressions that I spoke of a couple of weeks ago. Like being pecked at, they accumulate and erode self-esteem. They're not always verbal. Sometimes it's someone who crosses a street or clutches their purse or follows you in a store. In my first year in ministry, a couple shared with me something that had happened in a local shop. She was Cree, him white. They came into the store separately and 
the person working there didn't realize that the woman who came in after him was his spouse. As she came in, the clerk made a big sniffing noise. <gasps> Ugh, I smell. Indian, they said. The husband went to the clerk and store a trip off, a tore a strip off, but most often his wife had to face this circumstance on her own. Now more troubling is what black, indigenous, and other people of color experience regularly with police and not just in a possible arrest situation. Oluwu wrote about how when she just got her driver's license at the age of 16, she was pulled over in a mostly white neighborhood. When she reached for the glove box for her registration insurance, as the officer had told her to do, he suddenly yelled, stop, as he reached for his gun and lectured her as to why you never, ever do anything without telling the officer what you're about to do first. That's a good way to get yourself shot, young lady, he said. I've never had to tell police what I'm about to do. I've never had to think about how I'm going to respond to the officer, where my hands are, or had to text quickly what's just happened, just in case. But black people do. They're perceived as a greater threat, even a teenage girl. And in Canada, black and Middle Eastern drivers are pulled over more often than white ones, ticketed more often. And in the U.S. are more likely to be searched, even handcuffed, than white drivers. And that's just driving. Even children are seen as a threat. Olu shares about a five-year-old who was suspended for assaulting a teacher. A staff member wanted this kindergartner charged by the police. Kindergartner, why not just talk to him? See what's going on. And it's not a Canadian practice to document race in terms of student discipline, but a recent study in Ontario suggests we have a similar issue here as in the US, where black children are more likely to be suspended, expelled, or referred to to the police than white kids are. Are they more violent, more disruptive? No, but that is unconscious bias at work. They're also perceived as older. That's how a 12-year-old holding a toy gun is killed. Imagine the constant sense of fear for adults, parents, kids, taking a toll emotionally and physically so along with these birds of fear, there are also weeds. Now at first the seedlings do well, but they start getting choked out. We speak of a glass ceiling, but you need to be in the building for there to even be a ceiling. Not only do black, indigenous, and Latinx kids receive harsher discipline, but despite being as bright as white kids, they're viewed as less likely to succeed, are less often tested for gifted classes, more often tracked towards vocational training. And classmates have biases as well. Oluwu writes how as she aspired to go to university, she was put down by the other nerdy kids. That's the way she describes them. And as much as she grew, well, the weeds grew as well. She got her degree, but struggled to find a job. She wasn't taken seriously for promotions, and even when she was offered one, when they realized she was black, the offer was rescinded. Now, the last couple of months, I've been having some frank conversations with people of color in the congregation and her experience happens here in Canada. Race factors into pay disparity as well. Did you know the US, 
the biggest gap is between Latino men and white men. 69 cents to the dollar. Now that speaks to me about plants that wither because they don't have anything to root into. The image reminded me of a discussion we had recently at Hare about black Nova Scotians. In addition to freed slaves, there were also black loyalists who came to Nova Scotia. They'd fought alongside the British during the revolution and more came in the War of 1812. In both cases, promises of land weren't kept. In fact, many didn't even have title to property. In Africville, which is close to Halifax, well, that's where the city dump ended up being placed. And rather than bring services to the area, in the 1960s, the city wanted to relocate the residents. Well, no deeds meant you didn't get full value for your home when you were relocated. We ask how there can be intergenerational poverty. I ask instead, why wouldn't there be when these soldiers and then their sons couldn't get work? generation after generation. Add to that the pay gap, higher rates of incarceration due to racial bias, difficulty in getting a bank loan to either open a business or to go to school. The system starts to feel really, really fixed. And that's what Kimberly Jones names in a YouTube video. I hope you've seen it. She calls out how slavery made it possible for white families to gain wealth and to pass it down from generation to generation. She compares it to a monopoly game where for the first 400 rounds you play for your opponent. And then when you get to play for yourself, every time you get ahead, your opponent slaps you down again. It's powerful testimony and cuts through all of the I succeeded, why can't you, malarkey that are often leveled against communities of color. As I shared last week, part of our spiritual journey is to let go of ourselves so that love can grow and we can nurture supportive community. In other words, so we can cultivate good soil. For those of us who are white, that means facing some hard truths about the way the world really is for most people. Ch Jesus challenges the injustices in the world and stands with us as we do the same in ours. Barbara Holmes reminds us that we can't be hamsters on a wheel, effectively propping up an unjust system, but rather as seekers of light and life, we need to work together for a world where the foundations of hierarchy, dominance, and rationality are crumbling and where proponents of equity have found their public voice. That's what we see in the protests. It's what we hear in calls to defund the police. It's what we witness in people rallying to ensure there are means for everyone. I mean everyone to thrive. I believe spirit is at work in this, reminding us that if we are made in God's image, which we profess to believe, then seeds shouldn't be pecked at. There should be enough soil for the seedling. The seedling shouldn't be choked out by weeds. Instead, there needs to be good soil for us all. So let's cultivate that. Amen.
Let us pray. We gather as sisters and brothers united in friendship and in faith. We turn our hearts in prayer, call to put into practice what we profess and pray for. Creating God as we slow down in this summertime, we pause to give thanks for the beauty of the world around us. For majestic forests and rolling farmland, farmland. for back gardens of lettuce and slowly ripening tomatoes. For the abundance so close at hand, a reminder of your generosity and our call to be stewards of this precious world. God of shalom, with people all around the world, we yearn for a true and lasting peace. Yet that peace continues to be shattered in so many places. Protests in Hong Kong, tension brewing between India and China, Volatility between the U.S. and China as the U.S. engages in exercises in the South China Sea. Continuing armed conflict affecting so many in Yemen. Closer to home as protesters continue to seek an end to systemic racism, we hear the call, no peace, no justice. Reminded that everywhere in the world the causes of peace and justice are intertwined. Compassionate spirit, we pause to pray for the many who are suffering, especially because of the ongoing pandemic. In impoverished parts of the world, the pandemic is increasing food insecurity and millions are brought to the brink of starvation. Rates of infection surge in many parts of the world, especially in the US and Brazil, where the practice of wearing or not wearing a mask has become politicized. We pray that leaders look to science in making policies and always consider the needs of the most vulnerable. And in our local community, we remember the Canner, Kim, and Smith families as they grieve recent deaths, as well as remember those who were ill or recovering from surgery. Holy love, we come together with our own private concerns. Beyond that, there are so many more people carrying burdens that are known to you alone. We hold them all now in our hearts. So let us continue to pray, echoing the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now sing together, As a Fire is Meant for Burning. It is found in your hymn book, Voices United, number 578, if you have one at home. But of course, the words and music will be on your computer.
As our service comes to an end, I invite you to join now in our blessing. As we go forth from here, may we be strong in spirit, courageous in will, and gentle of heart. Each day may our actions be rooted in wisdom, nurtured by hope, and open to love. May we meet others as we would wish to be met, with a heart of compassion and a spirit of healing and grounded in joy. Now our Zoom room is going to remain open so you can visit and uh, converse with each other. Now I will be on holiday for the next uh, three weeks, but next week you can join Linda Butler online. And again, uh, the following week, and then Evelyn McLaughlin will be there with you on August the 2nd. Enjoy. <laughs>